Hard work, work. Hard work. That's what they say. Hard work, work. Hard work. I earn my pay. Hard work, work. Hard work. Do it every day. Hello, hello, and welcome everybody to another edition of Snipes Castle with your host, Senior Chief D. LaMonica. A lot of people want to know why I call myself Senior Chief D. LaMonica. Well, I remember when I was young, uh, I had an issue with my, I didn't want anybody to know my middle name. I didn't want anybody to know my middle name. And uh, when somebody found out my middle name, oh my gosh, they would tease me, tease me. And you know, I went through life, uh, not want anybody to know my middle name. So when I got to my first ship, and of course, they're going to they're gonna see your middle name. You know, they print out the training. Uh, you got to sign the training. And then they always include your freaking middle name on there. So they saw my middle name. And oh, my gosh, man. They they, they called me LaMonica usually m- most of the time, the whole time I was on that ship. By the time I left that ship, I was like numb to it. And I was like, man, that's a pretty cool name. And then really, Daryl LaMonica, my uncle named me Daryl LaMonica. After this Italian football player, he used to play for the Oakland Raiders. They used to call him the Mad Bomber. So I was like, man, Daryl LaMonica, pretty cool. He, he threw on Mad Bums. He like threw like four touchdowns in a, in, in a game. So he was a pretty cool dude. He just died. He died a couple of years ago. But uh, yeah, that's Daryl LaMonica. So I call myself D. LaMonica. That's my middle name. But again, we got another exciting show for you. All right. I really want everybody to take a look at this show because um, what we're going to talk about is uh, very serious, very personal. All right. Today, we are going to bring back our Master Chief Petty Officer Amari Pontiano back for the second part of his interview. I wanted to do his career overview first which is available for viewing here on Facebook. Uh, it provides a blueprint, a sort of roadmap to Master Chief Petty Officer showing key points in his career that helped him uh, on his path to being selected for Master Chief. I also wanted to give Master Chief time to walk us through his experience during the October 12, 2000 terrorist attack on board the USS Cole DDG-67, which killed 17 and injured 37 of our shipmates. Like I said in the post on here before, um, some of us will do a whole career without having to experience what Master Chief experienced. And we all hope and pray that none of our shipmates never will. No one knows when tragedy will strike. So here to talk about what happened on the cold through his eyes, please welcome again, Master Chief Petty Officer Amari Ponciano to Snipes Castle. Welcome there, Master Chief. Back to the show. Thank you, my brother. All right. Now, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to impose, I'm going to show everybody uh, what you got coming out here in a couple of months. So I'm going to show that on the side. And I'm going to share my screen. Let me see. Okay, there it goes. There we go. Right there. Anchored in Resilience is a book written by uh, Master Chief, and it will be coming out in a a few months, a few months. Yes, Um, yeah, willing. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go through uh, his experience on the USS Cole. All right. So, uh, for you know, most of us know the story, but I, I read read about it, and but on October twelfth, two thousand, en route to the Persian Gulf, the coal made a fuel stop in Aden, Yemen. Um, now, when that when the ship stopped in Aden, it anchored, uh, tied up. Um, what were you doing? All right, so. Uh... I was part, of course, of uh, of the sea and anchor uh, detail. Um, you know, as as a seaman on a destroyer, you know that you're part of every evolution, right? Like that. Right. That's you don't. You know, you're gonna do your sea and anchor. You're gonna do your, you know, on rep. Like you name it, we're part of it. So, um, on the morning of October 12, I remember coming into the port in Yemen, and um. As we were pulling in, something striked all of us that was very weird, which was um, as you coming in, 
the port, the way it was set up is is think about it kind of like in a U, right? Where you know you got a, a U form and then like land is all the way over there, and then the the refueling pier was like in the middle of it. Um mm-hmm. so like right in the middle of the water, and it was a small little pier that you know you could probably fit like 10 people. Um and we were like the way the ship was pulling in was facing towards land. Um, which then uh, the the commanding officer uh, asked to change it to where we were facing outwards, like going back to sea, because he said if something happens, he wanted to be able to just straight go instead of trying to go to all the maneuvers to get us to to face out. Uh, but as, but as as we were going in, um, you saw like four or five sunk ships in the port. They they look like uh, old naval ships from the the Yemenis uh, uh, navy or whatever. Uh, but it just it was I never seen that before, right? Like I never you know at that time um, it was my first deployment, but we already pulled into about three or four different ports. So it was like the first time that we saw anything like that. And uh, I think there's still there's a video on YouTube uh, from like the the person because you know we had people you know every port that we recorded as we were pulling into a port. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, you could hear our comments in there, like, well, you know, like, where are we getting ourselves into kind of thing? Um, but, you know, we pulled in like any other port that we've been to. And, uh, you know, we right away, you know, started refueling. Um, and then there's the secure, the, the, the sea and anchor detail uh, started refueling. And I went to radio to, to do uh Cause that was where my station was. And I like, I, I was, I, I was on the day watch. Uh, and I just happened to be there with another it and then a deck seaman that wanted to strike it. So we were training him, uh, mm-hmm. so he could convert to it. Okay. So, so when it exploded, you were inside the ship. Yes. Correct? So, but this time, so once I, we started refueling. We were refueling like really fast, like faster. We were supposed to be there for like four or five hours. Yeah, yeah. But but after like two hours or maybe even less, uh, this XO came over the one MC and said, "Hey, we're refueling a lot quicker than expected. We're gonna um, call early chow. So for all the people on the CN anchor detail to go and you know eat chow, and then you know." said the sea anchor detail so we could get out of here um so then i went uh i went to the line and i remember that the seaman was who was simon uh Wiber- Wiberly, and the it and itsr was uh, seaman guana they both were like hey let's go ahead of the line and i was like hey man we're i'm an it nobody believes we have watch uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. nobody won't let nobody in for early child yeah, like- yeah, everybody got early. early child, right? <laughs> I was like, Let me just stay in the in the back. And and to be honest, there was a girl that I liked, so I was like talking to her, and I was <laughs> yeah. str- I was directly in front of repair five, like like right that door on yeah. the starboard side, um, for repair uh for repairs five, and um, so I'm literally standing there for like a good five to ten minutes. And then I heard like the loudest noise I ever heard in my life. Um, and um, my feet came off the ground and I like kind of like tilted back and I hit myself with the bulkhead in the back. And then I f- full forward and I kind of hit the person that I was talking to. And um, and like at first, the first thought that came to my head was the refueling station blew up. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the next thought was, well, I'm standing in the starboard side. That's where we were refueling. So if this was the refueling station, I'll, I'll be dead. Um, so I kind of like moved to the side to like look in that, you know, that P way that goes across for where in, in the in the galley. So you could, you know, get your food served in the middle of the ship. Right. Um, right. And and I'm not trying to make light of it, you know, because a lot of people, pat, you know, died and 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 it's a lot of uh, people got injured. But like, if if it looked like in the movies when you see fire and smoke coming your way after an explosion. Mm-hmm. Um. So then my first instinct was I need to go topside so there is, you know, so I'm not all, I don't get burned or there's a lot of smoke or whatever. 
Um, so I started hurting, uh, moving back aft and on my way towards the, the, the aft for the ship to go to the flight deck, um, the executive officer was coming from top side and he was like, Hey, we've been hit, go to your uh, general quarter station. Um, because unfortunately, um, uh, back then we didn't have redundancy for the one MC. So, uh, the one MC was not working not working okay yeah so general quarters be happened word of mouth word of mouth yes so my gq station was uh radio so as i i'm heading so i got to pass again through the same area that i just left from um and now you could kind of see the light from the outside that just tells you like the hole is that big that you could see that light coming from you know um from outside of the you know of the ship so I head down to radio. I get down to radio. There's no power. And my chief uh, tells me, hey, um, I have a, an alpha and a bravo, which means like two people for the save. Um, I don't need you here. Go to your old uh, GQ station. Um, and my old GQ station uh, used to be repair to a forward. Mm -hmm. So I head that way. And I can't remember if it was an officer or a chief that was standing, but I know it was someone with a khaki bell. And they were standing in the front right by the door of Repair 2. And uh, he said, hey, uh, all damage control efforts are happening uh, from Repair 3 all the way back off. Mm -hmm. So he was like, head down that way. Um, and I remember as, as it was happening, right, like, I was walking around the ship and like nobody had to tell me that I needed to open and close hatches. Like that be that was like the muscle memory automatic. It, it was just happening as I was doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, like I will go from one space to the other because you know you got to keep the, the the watertight integrity. Um, and then I got to uh, before I get to repair three. Um, if you remember on the DDGs when you when you uh, and especially in the east and the east six and below. Uh, ga uh, mess decks, there is the scullery where you put your, you know, your, um, your trade. And then there's right. a little space that as you come under the scullery, there's like a little space right in between the actual P way. And right, then right. The, the just, so there was a body that was laying there. Oh my gosh. And then, you, 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 so you saw, of course you saw it. Yeah. Well, it was covered with a blanket. Okay. Um, okay. But I, I don't know what, why I got you know, curious, and I lifted the blanket up, and uh, it was uh, Seaman Gunn, who was a single man at the time, now they're quartermasters, um, and he used to be one of the guys that we hang out, it was, it was five of us that we used to hang out, because we were all in the same duty section as well when we were uh, in port, um, and I, I, I couldn't recognize him, and the only way that I was able to recognize him was because he, you know, his coverall still had his name tag, because he has so much metal and stuff in his body that he was all swolled up and like so that's when the adrenaline went down and the 19 year old in me came in like i started crying emotions yeah emotions yeah the emotions over. finally took over and i just started crying i was i was on, on my knees looking at you know their body of a friend i'm scared i want to go home um i want to see my mother at the time was the only thing that I could think of. You know, I didn't have any children. I wasn't married, anything like that. My mother was my everything. Mm -hmm. And I was just crying. And I don't know how long, you know, I don't know if it was 20 seconds, a minute, two minutes. I don't know. But someone tapped me in my shoulder. And what he said at that moment might sound cold, but it was what I needed to snap. And that person said, he's dead. We need to save the ship and save ourselves. And I snapped and got up and headed back to repair three. I still was crying. Like I'm mm -hmm. still tears coming down my eyes, but then I headed to repair three. And once I got to repair three, I pretty much became a messenger. Um, you know, go here, take this water pump, you know, to this compartment, go take this buckets over here. So you could, you know, help out with taking water out, go, bring some brooms so we could help you know use it for 
for you know the injure like all i was doing was just moving around like i did not yeah. have it a specific job i did not save anybody's life i didn't do nothing heroic i was just do doing what i was told because in the back of my mind what i kept thinking was i'm gonna do whatever they tell me to do because i want to go home i want right. to go home to my mother um so then after that like that's i it failed like for hours but it was probably only like two or three hours that that the chaos lasted um but it felt like because of the adrenaline and all the things that i was seeing you know your my, my mind was extra stimulated because of the the bodies that i was seeing the injure you know and then you start like every time they would send me to do stuff you know it's only human to start looking for people like where's so-and-so and where's so-and-so oh he's alive oh he's alive but injured you know or she's alive and, and whatever and uh it, it was it was i have had like pretty good workouts in my life. And I don't, I never been as tired if I was after those two or three hours, because my mind was as smooth as, as, as was as, as in shock as my body was as well. But thankfully I was nothing injured with me, but I was like, I was exhausted. Um, and that continued for hours. The mental, basically mental dra draining, draining you mental draining yeah. your body yeah. strength pretty much. Cause, Absolutely. Uh, so Absolutely. It's like, wow. Oh my goodness. All right. Um okay, when okay, you you say you saw saw the body. Uh now it was reported the ship sunk until it hit the bottom. So for three days following the explosion, the crew members worked uh tirelessly to control flooding and perform damage control. During those three days, explain your work to, to sleep ratio. How did you eat? Did you sleep? Yeah. If, if you did. So, um, so yeah. So like once that happened, like I said, it was a good two, three hours where kind of things, I won't say they were like, everything was okay, but like we kind of settled into a pattern, right? Like, mm -hmm. Hey, uh, you know, we need to have a pump at all times here. We need to close these hatches. Like, so once that happened, um, you became like, they started organizing things like, Hey, we need certain people to do this. We need certain people to man the 50 cows because we didn't know if they had snipers, if they had people like waiting for us to be, because we were all in this outside of the ship now, like, right. Unless you were in a fire party or, or, uh, or, you know, de flooding or like something like that. Like everybody else was like in the skin and outside of the ship. Cause it was either treating the injure or, um, or just simply like manning the 50 cows or, you know, try to get comms. Um, because like I said, like it didn't, you know, we didn't have any power. So like we had to get like the special radio that we have to try to get communication. Uh, so the CEO can talk back to all the way back to, you know, here to DC and whatever, and let them know that we've been attacked. Mm -hmm. Um, so first of all, um, we all had to stand some sort of watch or do something right like there was we you know uh here's where that that training and why everybody goes to dc university right as you check into the ship yeah because for example me as an it since nothing was working within radio i didn't need to be an it anymore but i needed to be a dc man or you know or or, or have or take that responsibility of damage control so like my station was not back in radio my station was stay in the space and let us know if the water raises to this level right because mm -hmm. then we need to do something about it or stay in the space with this pump and if you know the the gas is going out then we need to bring a new one you know what i mean like i became yeah. more more of a damage control person right like i yeah. wasn't doing anything related with radio um because it was not needed so um we try to go to sleep, at least me and a, and, a, and a couple of people later on that night and our birthing, but then like water started coming into the birthing. So like everybody started freaking out like, hey, uh, we're going to, you know, we might drown or it's going to flood. So we went and we slept like me. I slept on the a midships by the missile deck. Right. So we were sleeping outside. Like most of the ship, most of the crew, if you were not standing to watch or if you were not, you know, in a... In a in a damage control area, you were sleeping in this uh, outside, outside of the ship, uh, which it was okay at night. Um, you know, although you know you 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 
you're spending this in a non-skid, which is horrible. But yeah. yeah, but like at least it was not like too bad. But then when the temperature will rise, we are we were in Yemen and like yeah. by like five in the morning was that already on like a hundred degrees. Right. Um and then for food, the reefer deck were destroyed, the mess deck was destroyed. So for the first 48 to 72 hours, all we were eating was stuff that was inside of the ship store that thankfully was all the way up forward and mm -hmm. like the storage was also like right next to it so like nothing was damaged right. so we were able to eat that kind of food um so like our food was like for lunch it would be like a gatorade with a milky way or a gatorade <laughs> right. with snacks a bar. yeah like that was our food um mm -hmm. we didn't have no portable water um, so there was no showers, there was no, you know, we were drinking, we had to be very cautious of like, Hey, a water bottle need to be shared by two people. Um, you know, uh, so then that happened for a good 48 to 72 hours until we got help from other ships. Mm -hmm. So other ships came, uh, what, when, when, did, when did the first ship show up? So the first ship that showed up, um, and, 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 and I'm, I, I apologize if I'm not correct 100% as far as like it was 72 or 96 hours, but it was between those two. And it was the USS Cook, Donald Cook, VDG 75. Um, mm -hmm. And they showed up and um, they started, at first they started sending food. Them and a British, a British ship, I can't remember the name of the British ship, mm -hmm. started sending food and water and things like that. Um, we also got the... Uh, fast team for the Marines and they took over, they took over the entire perimeter as far as security. So like okay. now we didn't have to stand watches cause they had the Marines and the 50 cows, they had boats, um, you know, and the perimeter running around, uh, the ship. So, you know, we didn't get attacked again or stuff like mm -hmm. that. I will say that the German, uh, the Yemen government started sending us food like 24 to 48 hours, but we were so angry and like so, you know, like as their fault, and nobody was eating that food, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't think anybody wanted to. I think we drank like the water or whatever that they were sending, but mm -hmm. we were like, nah, we're not. This food could be poison. Like that's what our thought was. So, yeah. So, so after okay, that that first night, you, um, you got a chance to sit down, take a breather, gather your thoughts about everything that happened how did you feel so you know like that's the first night um it uh in between all that that was happening you know like helping with uh, damage control and stuff yeah um doc uh asked a group of us if we could volunteer to you know go through the bodies of those that passed away and take their personal possessions so that way we could give it to their families right so that it won't get lost since it's, it's, it's um, you know, going in between, you know, the ship all the way back to the U.S. And uh, I so you had to a group of y'all. They 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 had all gathered the bodies that they could, mm -hmm. and y'all had to go basically go through their pockets or whatnot. Yep, and take their personal belongings, basically bag it up for the families. Yes, yes. Um, so you was one of those people. Yeah, I was one of those. I only did I only did two bodies. Um God damn. But uh I it's one of those things that like looking back, you know, I know why I did it. I felt like if mm -hmm. it was me, I would have won someone to do the same so my mother could have my possessions. Yeah. But like because of the nightmares that I had ever since then and the things that are still in my head, I wish I would have not done it if you if I'm being honest with you. But at that moment I felt like, you know, that's the least I could do. Um, so that happened then Man, you gotta be a brave i mean you 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 gotta be a brave person to do that you know we're we're in the you know we're in the navy, we're in the military, you know you automatically think we're brave, but come on, I mean we're really kids <laughs> you I, I, I mean kids absolutely i was military and you i know, was I was five days away from being twenty years old because it happened yeah. on the 12th of October, my birthday is the seventeenth of October, so I was twenty years old, let's just say that, and i i and again, I was terrified. I was scared, but it it 
it it all built, boiled down to like, which I talk about a lot more now, and I talk about it in my book as well, like how having a why or 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 a sense of purpose can mm-hmm. make you do so many great things in your life. And for me, at that time, which I didn't know, I didn't understand it, um, but I like my purpose was always my mother, right? Mm-hmm. So. So whatever actions I took during that time was with the belief of either that's what I would like people to do for me because of my mother, or I'm going to do this because I want to come back to my mother. So in that case, I didn't want to touch a dead body and and go. But then I was like, if that was me, I would want my personal stuff to go back to my mother. Right. So I'm going to do that because this person has a mother, has a wife, has kids. and I would want them to have, or he would have want them to have his wallet, his, his, you know, his, even his dog tags. Cause we had that back then, like those kind of things. Right. So as, as traumatizing as that might be, um, I don't regret it. Right. Like I, I, I'm, I'm glad that I, I did it. Um, it has come with its consequences. Right. Uh, as far as, like mm-hmm. I said, my PTSDs and nightmares and stuff like that. So, so once that happened, I kind of had a time to like sit down um, I, I was, I was, you know, crazy about a certain person and on the ship as far as a lady. So I looked for her and I sat down and talked to her, you know, make sure that she was okay. But then as things were settling, like I said, we, I started looking for people like where's so-and-so and where's so-and-so. And then I will see, okay, that person is over there with the injured. Or I will see like, for example, my LPO, he, he was one of the injured that his jaw was broken. So they took him out of like base. You know, they put him in a small boat and got him to a hospital. Uh, but I, I saw him. So I was like, okay, he's alive. He's good to go. Mm-hmm. And then, like, as things kind of settled, I got cu- more curious. And, like, me and another person, we decided to go, like, let's look for the people that we haven't found. And uh, we found ourselves on midship when everything happened. Um, and... By that moment, all power was secure, so nothing was sparkling or, or smoking. It was just simply like this huge hole and water coming in, right? Right. Um, so if you could picture the destroyer and you know where the CMC office is, right. like the ground was blown up all the way to that door. Dang. Okay, so, so I mean, it, it just not a, a blown into the shit into the cmc yeah that's that's a good that's a that's a big hole right there yeah so it took it took most of the galley away like like most of the galley was sent to pieces and like the way it was it was like it it, the metal like either burn or or like or flex to be like consumed all the way towards so like i literally got to the edge and like lean and you can see down to the other decks wow and that's when i saw in one of the decks, like one of the, I saw a dead body like wrapped up in like metal. Then if you looked in another area, you saw another body. Um, then inside of the galley, you saw another body that, that you know, she um, like, like with the impact, um, like she will, she was like literally like bowled up, but like the way that she was like bowled up, is like something that didn't look natural, right? Like you could see her spine was broken kind of thing. Um, so so they didn't like, hey, you can't go in these areas right here because there are deceased bodies right here. It was no, just I, I, at open. first, yeah, at first, no. I think I think so ma- too many too many of us were worried about like saving the ship and you know making sure that all these different things were like in, in stone before then they started like thinking like, oh, okay, like let's not have people go to this area because that's gonna be traumatized. And then, like I said, I was just a curious guy right and like my excuse my excuse was i was a runner for most of the of of the day you know go here go there so like nobody kind of like told me like hey don't go here or you know what are you doing why you like walking around like i just i always had like a legit reason why i was going to one place to another um yeah and then i saw that and i i remember even seeing um one of the one of my shipmates um he was the decapitated and like you could, I guess he was trying to cover himself as like whatever was coming his way. Yeah. Hand was like cut as well as his head and like was like stuck. Right. And I remember like seeing that and um, yeah, man, like I just, I, I, 
it's it just some of the things that now I look back, right? That I'm just like, why did I I did that to myself, right? Because I at that moment I was not like I was not told to go there to do anything official. I just simply was looking for people. But uh, you know, for all the the uh, therapy and counseling that I've been to, that every psychiatrist and psychologist that I have talked to, they just like you wanted to know where where your friends are. So like that's a that's a that's a common human thing to do is to look for people. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, natural, these, you yeah. know, natural, you know, these your buddies you see yeah. every day and you're like, yeah, it's just, such I mean, such at, at that moment, we were already like two and a half months into a deployment. And, you know, this being in a, in a small crew, like you get to know people really well, two and a half yeah. months away, you, you, you know, everybody, you know, so, yeah. so it was, it was that. And like, so now by this time is by the time I, I got, I came back from that area, it's probably like six or seven and then the evening and it just. At that moment, as I'm just sitting there, I was sitting in the flight deck, and uh, all I can think of was like, like how much longer we need to be here because I just want to be home. Like mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about any more about saving the ship. I wasn't thinking about standing no watches. I just wanted to go home, right? And I, yeah. uh, I got consumed by the fact of like I couldn't talk to my mother and let her know that I was okay. Wow. So as time went on, you get support from the Marines. They take over force protection. You got some Navy ships. They showed up, provided support. Now, um, what I wanted to ask ship to the Now, when w was it finally, okay, we've done everything we can damage control wise. W when, w when was that that they said, okay, it's now time for when when did y'all actually begin filtering off the ship? Because y'all didn't ride the ship over when they took it, correct? Yep, that's correct. So so I wanna say about like again, you know, forty eight hours, maybe ninety and seventy two at the most, we started doing things that you would out to see. And what I mean by it is we started having quarters, we started having muster. We even had started having colors. And I remember, uh, and I talk about that in other interviews that I've done, and I talk about it in my book, how we started having colors, for example, in the morning, you know, raising the flag. And I remember it was, man, it was uh, probably 100, 110 degrees, just super hot. And the the commanding officer authorized for us to relax our coveralls, which meant, you know, you could take the top off, have just your white shirt and then tie, mm -hmm. tie it in the middle. But when we were doing colors, we had to put our uniform back and, you know, be how it's supposed to be. Right. And Seaman Ponciano was not trying to hear that. Like, I just, I just, I couldn't understand what was the point? Like, I just, you know, I was young and, and, you know, I was just like, it's so hot. Why are we worried about what I'm wearing or how I'm wearing my uniform? Why are we even having colors? Like, that's a, that was my thing. Yeah, or, like, or like why, why are we doing duty section turn yeah, outside yeah. in the rain when there's a yeah. heel hanging right there? Yeah, like, yeah, like, <laughs> why are we, exactly. Like, why are we doing this? Like, and I remember, Ken, again, I don't remember the, the, the chief's name, but it was the chief. And... He kind of grabbed me, you know, he, you know, back then, you know, it, it was a little bit different, you know, chiefs and, and, you know, will put your, their hands on you to an extent, you know, like I, the way he grabbed me, let's just put it the way, the way he grabbed me, I could never grab anybody like that today. Yeah. Um, oh my God. He assaulted me. Yeah, exactly. So he just kind of <laughs> grabbed me, right? Like, like yeah. kind of on a choke and he was like, Hey, cause you know, I was complaining and I was being loud and like, this is bullshit. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing this? And he was like, they need to see that no matter what happens, that flag will fly. This is not for you. This is not even for us. This is for them to see that we, no matter what happens, that flag will be up there and we're going to show them we're, that we're not defeated. Right. I'm going to be honest with you. God damn it, you. Even at that time, it's still like, yeah, it, yeah, we're over it here. didn't mean anything. I was 20 yeah. years old, right? Mm -hmm. But as I've as, as, as I gotten more senior, as I gotten older, it had such such a meeting that I could I could tell you right now if I was in that position, if I was a master chief or a chief or whatever today, and I would have been in the cult, I would have done the same thing. Mm -hmm. Whatever yeah. seaman that would have been complaining about it. So so 
what we did was like, which is another thing that we did, like um, the leadership thought that it would be important to have some sort of like normalcy by doing right. it first, mm -hmm. by, you yeah. know, we were still, you know, we were even like, we will clean certain area, like cleaning station, but it will just be the, the certain areas that we could, you know, we were even like, like the meals that would come from other ships and from Yemen. Cause by now, uh, because of the, uh, the Marines who set up a small base, uh, in the, in the shore, like food that was coming from these hotels were go through them. So like now we felt like they were clean. So like, but those meals came at like the, the same times that we will have chow. So like, it was like everything, like as normal as they could make it, they made it right. Right. You know, um, like your watches were not like, oh, just stand there for six, seven hours. It would be like, oh, watch is supposed to be four hours. So you stand and watch for four hours. Mm -hmm. So, so that's like, they started bringing some normalcy. And then another thing that they did was um, they started sending people from, because then we got uh, a supply ship, the USS Candom, um, and they started sending people from those ships, from the Cook and from the Candom, to us, so like they let's say they will send like five engineer guys, so they could stand watch and help out, and then they will send five of us over there so we could take a shower, so we could sleep in a in a, in a clean rack instead mm -hmm. of sleeping outside. So they started doing those things, and I remember they sent me to the USS Camden, so I could you know have a night to sleep there or whatever, and like use the phone to talk to my mother and and, and those things. And I remember as I was coming on board the ship. They had the crew lined up, you know, like when they do when they, you know, a, a, a admiral is coming through or an or right. officer and they, you know, they don't goes on, you know, like ding, ding, heroes arriving. And I just I I was like caught off guard to hear that. I mean, I was a seaman. I never even heard of that. Um, but yeah, oh, that cool. we, we were able to, you know, like I stay in a state room, you know, I, I had a, like really good food and was able to take a shower. I went to the radio and talked to my mother. Um, but that was probably already by like day three or four then happened. And then um, we had divers that came because um, they started like finally taking those bodies out. Right. Like, you know, and putting in caskets and getting them out. Um and by then, now we also had like cell phones that we could talk to our family. And I remember our, I had, we, they only gave us like four or five minutes that you could call your family. And um, unfortunately, I didn't update my page two before deployment with my mother's number. So my mother never got a phone call from the Navy saying whether I was alive or dead or injured, nothing. So for four days, my mom did not know what happened to me. She knew that my ship got bombed because in CNN, they will show the the ship and the the hold, you know, sixty seven. Right. And she was mm -hmm. like, "That's a Maori ship, right?" Because I sent her literally, I sent her a picture when we were in Malta, where you could see the sixty seven, and you know, in the in the address it has, you know, USS Cole. Um, yeah. And she was just like, she, my mom did not eat for like four days until I make that phone call. Wow. You know, and I was just like, I'm alive, I'm okay. Um, I sounded, she said that I sounded like a robot because I didn't say much. I was just simply like, I'm alive. I'm okay. And she kept like asking, are you eating? Are you doing this? And I just be like, I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, like and, I think, <laughs> and, I, and I think I was just like numb and I didn't want to go into details of like the things, the horrors that I've been through when I was seeing. Um, so yeah. So then fun, as, as the bodies were starting to be taken away, you know, and every, I got to give it to, to our chain of command. Like they, they did it like they will hold like it will be like a mini ceremony for each casket as they will come out from the skin of the ship to like in the casket and then move, getting them out to the boat to then go to the shore side. And then the question came like, hey, we need to have people to escort each of these bodies. So for the 17 that were going back, we needed 17 people to be their escort. Um, and I was selected to be the escort for Simon Guana because uh, me and him were really tight. Uh, he was in IT. Um, so I left the ship like the day after my birthday, the 18th of October. Um, but the rest of the crew did not leave the ship until the November 2nd 
um, when she was put in on top of the Blue Marlin, right. and they had a ghost. They sent a, the Navy sent like a nav admin asking for volunteers, and then mm-hmm. they had a skeleton crew come on board. And then I think only the CEO and the and the CMC stay with the ship. Everybody mm-hmm. else had to fly out. Okay, all right. So everybody flew out. Um, wow. Uh, that's so you ask so how did that escort go you escorted all the way back to the united states yeah yeah so it, it was it was something man so so like i said there was um the like the marines came with so many like it was a a, a fast the the fast team and they came with a you know a bunch of marines and they came with all, all kinds of guns and all kinds of things and, and a, you know, C or uh, what is it? Uh, the, the big plane, the C-17s or whatever. Yeah. Um, and they, f- they freaked out Yemen, like to the point that the, 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 the country went into like shutdown because they thought we were, we get, we, we came there to fight now. <laughs> um, so, so we go and uh, the casket, there's two trucks that come to like, so they could put the caskets there to then take it to the airport and the marines have like um sniffing dogs like the dogs like to find explosive right. and one of them found one in one of the trucks are you serious they, they found a bomb yes so we were already in a bus all stop. of us all of us that were going to be escorting the bodies we were already in a bus that was going to follow the two trucks with the caskets so the marines come running from their their little um base that they set up and they come running get out of the truck get out of the truck so we get out of the i mean get out of the bus we get out of the bus and you know they get the driver out of the 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 truck that has you know the the quote-unquote bombs or whatever and they start like beating him up because the dog you know like sniffing dogs when they find something they just sit in that area they don't even move yeah the dog would just sit in there like there's something right here um, so that was like the first scare. So they finally get the truck out of the area, take the driver to investigate and interrogate him or whatever. So they put all the casket in one of the, the trucks instead of two, they put us back on the bus. They tell two Marines to go with us, you know, and they have the, the, their, um, their 16, um, and we just drive. But then like, as we drive in towards the airport, there's like a checkpoint feels like every half half a mile mm-hmm. um and it's like i said it's because yemen is like and shut and like shut down like because they're you know they're scared like something is about to pop off but every time they came on board we only had one person that spoke yemenese was which was like this os2 that was uh part of the embassy and they used to be like very um what's the right word like very aggressive when they were asked questions so it sounded it sounded like they were yelling like like mm-hmm. what you guys doing and where you going and then he had to yell and then the marines they had the guns like they had to say stuff it, it, it was a mess i was like terrified the entire time we get to the airport and this the the c-17 just you know parked there there's a here come like they're putting the casket in and we are surrounded by military from yemen and they all have their guns out right they're not pointing mm-hmm. at us necessarily but they all have their guns out um and we're just sitting there waiting in the tarmac finally we get in there we take off and then like a couple of hours into our flight um we had an issue with one of the engines so we had to emergency land in germany and yeah we just had to change Man, we had to change bomb, yeah to the <laughs> yeah in, we, we in had the to middle change. of the yemeni army now you got a issue yeah. with the plane i'm like god dang <laughs> we had to i think either they had to repair or we had to change i can't remember and then we flew into from germany all the way to dover air force base in delaware um and we landed were you there. In your, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but were you in your dress rights or were you in civilian no, clothes? No, we, we were in civilian clothes. We were okay, in, right. in civilian clothes because it was like super cold in the plane because those planes are for cargo. They're not right. like, you know, like we weren't even like we didn't even have seats. We just had like these like benches in the side mm-hmm. that we, we just okay. sat on. Um, so then we landed in Dover um, and uh, that's when we were first told that like, hey, uh, the Navy – just make the decision that you guys are not going to take the bodies all the way to their family. Like we have people that are trained to do that. You're not trained to do that. You just, we're just going to fly you guys to Norfolk and mm-hmm. 
the, from Dover, each of those um, bodies will go to whatever, you know, like for my guy, Iguana, he was going to go to Texas. So they were going to fly him to Texas. And then it was going to be uh, a, a team this you know prepared to do that to present you know uh the flag and to let the family know like there was going to do that instead of me mm -hmm. um so then from dover then we took these like felt like private jets um to uh norfolk and i flew i was in the first one that landed and i get there and it's like this huge amount of people because we're the first ones that come from the cold they're landing <laughs> yeah um there's chaplains, there's admirals, there's family, and like nobody comes to me because my family, my mom was in Dominican Republic, my parents were in Dominican Republic, so like I didn't have anybody waiting right. for me. And I remember the chaplain was like, "Where's your family?" And I was like, "They're in Dominican Republic." And uh, he just gave me a hug and he was like, "Well, your Navy family is here." Um, and then they took us, they took us to Portsmouth to the hospital, and they gave us a bunch of tests, exams, you know, like they did you know, physical, and then they did, like, mental, you know, exam or whatever, and then uh, they were, like, we're going to put you in these barracks, um, uh, not not the barracks, but, like, like they actually put us, like, the Navy gateway, they put it, like, in really nice suites, right, and they were, right. like, we're, we're going to give you a call tomorrow, because we're going to send you home, like, wherever you want to go, and the Navy is going to pay for that flight, so the Navy bought me tickets to go back to Dominican Republic, um and then gave me two weeks of convalescent leave and then i took a third week so i i i went to dominican republic for 21 days okay all right and that's pretty much um so you 21 days when that 21 days ended and you what what were you going back to so yeah so i you know 21 days in dominican republic and it was it was like a bittersweet kind of thing like yes i was I was with my mother, but like, you know, too many, so many people wanted to know, like, I remember, um, the person that she was married to at the time, he wanted to like take advantage of it and trying to like, you know, I don't know, like, I don't know, make, make me famous and make, or make himself famous. I don't know what he was trying to do, but like he, you know, try to get newspapers to do stories and like in, in television or whatever. And I just, I remember like, just saying I, i'll do one interview but then that's it like i don't want to be talking about this mm -hmm. um and uh you know so like i didn't i didn't really enjoy my time right like i was happy to be with my mother because that's who i wanted to be but like everybody i felt like everybody wanted to know something of what just happened which is understandable right right i, I don't blame you gotta her. relive it over yeah reliever oh what exactly like, yeah what happened man, i don't and told I just, the story like yeah. 10 times yeah and i'm just <laughs> you like know, you I just, just want to be left alone exactly with your mom <laughs> yes and uh you know and then like my mom was very religious at that time so like you know she made like all these promises that like if you if i was still alive you know we would go to this church that's like two hours away and she'll say 10 hot you know uh you know holy mary's and all these different right, things right. and i just had to like do all this so like i was happy to be home like i said but i was also like stress um mm -hmm. so anyway so i come back and the decision was made to like treat the coal like a precom because we you know they decided that like we will rebuild it, her like mm -hmm. um at that time it would have been cheaper just to like build a brand new ship but really wow yes but Instead this, of repair the ship yeah but the symbolism <laughs> yeah. of of having the ship go back to sea um was higher right so they you know, they asked me if I wanted to take orders to another ship. And I remember uh, talking to a detailer uh, and I wanted to go to San Diego. Right. Um, and I was a seaman at the time. So I was like, it, I'm seaman. I'm not married. All I got is a sea bag. You know, I should be able to get orders to a ship in San Diego. And they said, no, um, they only offer me like ships in Norfolk. And I was like, well, if that's the case, then I'll just stay here and with the pre-com unit and, you know, go to schools and get any C's or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so like they that we were in a building, like everybody, and we were put in a in a they they just happened that they were rebuilding a brand new barracks in the in, in Norfolk uh, base, and they only put a coal sailors in that in that place, and like 
we got a bunch of like free stuff. Like I remember most barracks, you have to pay for your cable, but we got like, right. we had like cable in our room for free. Uh, we had like a bunch of different things because you got to remember the coal was before 9-11. So we were, we were at peace. So like, it was like a huge thing for America because like, it's like the very first time that like we've been attacked for no reason. Right. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So, so people were very, um, like, very given, very, like, they wanted to help us. Like, they couldn't believe that happened to us. So, like, um, you know, it, it was, we were treated in a way that, like, I, I'd never seen before. Maybe right after 9-11, where I felt like the country was, like, finally very united. Mm -hmm. um, that That's, like, kind of how we felt with the cold. Like, we, we got a lot of free stuff, a lot of things that, like, um, it was just simply because, like I said, like, nobody, like, the country has never been hadn't been attacked in in decades, and yeah, a, a we, lot we of were not a, support. Yeah, and a whole exactly. Bunch of, you know, gifts. You know, just to yep. say, hey, we support yep. you. You know, yeah, that's yeah. cool. Man. Yeah. So you always in North, basically in Norfolk, just going to school, just like a precom you did, basically sh pretty much shore duty. Yep, yep. Um, because then the ship was taken directly to Pasigula, so then, um, it took a few months before not a few months, almost a whole year before they decided, okay, now it's time to start bringing the crew mm -hmm. uh, back and help out. Like, cause then again, it became like you were in the shipyards. Um, so then like after a few months uh, of schools and things like that, then I got uh, sent to uh, Pasigula, Mississippi. Like I, I drove down there and then and I, we were there like a pre-com unit and, you know, going through the process of like getting the ship, you know, back into you know, new systems and having to do the SOVAD for these systems and having to stand watches and having to do all these things. Um, but then it became a lot, uh, really stressful because there were, um, we will get, Big Navy will get like uh, intel that there will be threats that, you know, that we're going to bomb the ship again. So like we were, we had so many watch positions because like in that shipyard, it's all civilians. So like, we were the ones that had to man every um, arm, you know, uh, watch. So we will be there. It got to a point that the ship, we had so many watches that we had to stand per, you know, four hour block that we were pouring starboard. Yeah. that I, Was it the coal or was it 9-11? I mean, force protection just went, you know, it, it basically went from you were standing watch in your whites at the front gate, <laughs> you know, in your whites at your front gate with a little security belt. And a, yep. I think a little billy club to damn you damn there look like Rambo, yes. <laughs> you know, at the head of the gate. So, so I will say, I, I think that was 9-11, but like we, we experienced that in Mississippi. I don't think the entire Navy was doing it, but mm -hmm. we were, had we had to do it because there were more threats to the, the coal while we were in Mississippi, uh, that, that, that we're going to bomb it again, or this is going to happen. Um, and of course, you know what that, that means, like be important starver, standing all these watches, people were getting in trouble because like you stand duty. Right. And then the next day you quote unquote off, but you still work in the entire day. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people like to drink, they will go drink. And then you are still, you know, have alcohol in your system for, you know, we're supposed to be eight hours, you know, between yeah. duties, we tell you, you know, you have, and people will just be partying until like midnight and then standing watch at five. So you, you are drunk still. Um, so there was people like falling asleep on watches. So that meant more people in trouble. It was, it was a mess, man. It was, it was, uh, it was a lot in the mind. Um, one are y'all getting professional counseling? So are y'all Everybody getting professional counseling. I think, you know, that's a way how they cope, you know, different people cope different ways. Yes. But so we are still getting professional counseling. So that's that's where I was going to go next. Uh, the two mm -hmm. things that happened that I will say I'm very grateful that did happen. Um, one is like I, because, we, you know, what happened with the coal or whatever, we were chosen the coal as the people that were going to provide bodies for the Super Bowl in New Orleans as far as to do the color guard. Mm -hmm. um, and I was lucky enough that I was picked as the, cause they had to, they wanted to pick a first class, a second class, a third class and a seaman. Um, and I was the third class that was picked. Um, and so I got to do that. Like I got to do the, that was the, the first Super Bowl that the Patriots won. 
Um, mm-hmm. Running that run, they played the 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 Rams and the Superdome. Um, so that was one good thing. But the other good thing that happened that I got to give the Navy a lot of credit is, like I told you, when we first got to Portsmouth, when I you know came back with the body, um, they started like they will do. I think it was quarterly or like every month they will do these questionnaires to see where you were at. So like, for example, if when I got back from, um, from bringing the body, like, you know, if my mental was at like a six, um, you know, 10 being really bad and one being good, if it was a six, like they will see how that will go for the next months. And I remember as, all these watches we had to stand and like going back now to like, we had to sleep on the ship. Like I started having like a lot of flashbacks and nightmares. Like it got to a point that like my mental was like a 10. So Mm -hmm. they literally pulled me to the side and they were like, you need to go see someone. And at that time was not a choice. You had to go see someone. And that's what I say that like, I'm grateful that they did that because I come from a very macho, you know, I'm Latino. I come from a very macho. Uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> culture that I would have never gone to God help myself. Like that would have been like, you know, uh, if I would have talked to my uncles, my parents, my, my, my father, my, my cousins, my friends, they would have been like, Hey man, just have a few drinks and find you <laughs> and you're going to be all right, bro. <laughs> yeah. So I'm grateful that the Navy forced me to do that. Cause, um, then I went to counseling and that's when I was diagnosed with PTSD. And then I was taken away from the coal and then sent to shore duty so okay yeah that's we went over that you got taken off the coal and you went to shore duty yeah and you were never on the coal again uh when it launched correct no i was not i was uh, i was actually um that that became like a thing like a fear that i didn't go on board the ship that's right Mm -hmm. i didn't go on board the ship and i'm not even like talking about like even seeing the ship from the pier for like 10 years after that. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, like, then, you, yeah, I, and then I just you couldn't, said, you, you, I couldn't see it. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. I remember, I remember I was in England and I was taking orders to go to a ship because I was coming for shore duty. And like one of the things that the counselor was saying was like, the therapist was like, Hey, you might want to take face that fear. Right. Um, so that's when I took orders to the Fort Sherman. Yes, it was not the coal, but it was a DDG. And I wanted to see mm-hmm. how I would do with that. And then I started going to, because every year we have, uh, you know, a ceremony that is done on the 12th uh, to commemorate, you know, the, the, what happened. Um, and I finally started going, because I wasn't even going to those things. So I didn't even want to see anybody. Like, I didn't want to, like, reminisce anything. So then I started to see him you know, those people. And it started like, it, it became part of my healing process. Mm-hmm. And then finally, here I am now a senior chief and I'm taking orders and I took the orders to a Deseron. And the reason why I took the orders to Deseron 22 is because the USS Cole was part of that Deseron. So I knew I was going to be going to the ship. Mm-hmm. And I finally, the first time that I was back on board, the USS Cole was from when this happened in 2000, the very first time I was back on board her was 2015, 15 years later. 15 years later. Wow. It, it, it's a process um, to overcome in such a traumatic experience such as that. And I, I, I think this is pretty much lifelong, you know, like uh, almost like, v, you know, the Vietnam veterans, you know, they have that, you know, just that that. You know, they always got stories, but they never want to talk about them and it yeah. stays with them for life. And um, and I guess you poured as much as you could into this book. It was was it like almost like a uh, part of that healing process when you yeah, write this book? I, absolutely. Absolutely. So so I've been very lucky in the past year and a half. I've been doing a lot of like uh, warrior toughness training, which is pretty much it. it's, you know, trying to get the sailors to understand about resiliency, right? About, you know, that you could, you know, you could fall down, but you could get up, right? That there is, you could take a hit, but you could keep pushing. That tomorrow is going to be better. Like those kind of thoughts, right? Um, so part of that is being to understand, right? Like, like this is always going to be a part of me, right? Um, and I remember one counselor I had when I was in England who said to me that like the best way that she could explain how this is going to be part of me 
is she said, think about someone who has an addiction, whether it's drug or alcohol, right? Whenever they get clear, clean, they'll tell you like, I'm in day 360 or I'm in day, mm -hmm. you know, 725. And it's not because they want to brag about the date. It's because they understand that any day they could go back to it. Mm -hmm. Any day could be that day that they drink again or they use drug again. And she said that that is that's related to my PTSD in the sense of like, I'm telling you, brother, I could have an amazing day today. Like, you know, I don't know, go to my favorite restaurant, be around, you know, my fiance, and my children, uh, do watch a soccer game, which is like what I love to do. Like I could literally do everything that I love doing in one day. And then tomorrow I feel like shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just that 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 I will live for the rest of my life with. So mm -hmm. the the book is truly one talking about my story because there there's a lot of things that even before the Navy that I dealt with that made me the man that I am for better or worse, right? Like there's things that mm -hmm. I have that are really good that's because of my childhood, and there's also things that are not that good that is because of my childhood. And then you get the 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 cold experience and then all the things that I had to deal with. Um, so it's more about letting people know that like, you could go through all these things cause I'm not any, I'm not special. I'm not any different than anybody else. I just happen to have a lot of things that happened to me and how, if I'm capable of doing it, then anybody can, then anybody can, but you have to have certain things. And one is looking for help, right? Like some of it, I was told that you will get some help. Others, like, for example, when I got divorced, uh, or when my marriage was not working and then I finally got divorced, like I seek help, right? One, because I wanted mm -hmm. her back, but then truthfully is because I needed it. Um, so that's one thing. Like you have to, two is admitting the fact that you have issues, right? Like, like if we don't, you're never going to get better about anything in life if you don't admit that you have a problem, whether it's yeah. alcohol, whether it's my PTSD, whether it's, I don't know if you're unfaithful, like if you, if you have issues like you're not going to get anywhere until you admit to that um and then two and then another thing is too is like i want to acknowledge the the amazing people that i i have had the privilege to have in my life right like we don't do anything alone right like even even when even this like right in this book right like i did it i wrote it i was the one that you know set myself to write 500 words every day but i needed the encouragement of you know, my lady, like she was the one that I like, was like, hey, you, you know, you talk to people all the time. You go into, you know, you go into the khaki bowl and making speeches. You go into pinning ceremony and making speech and you go in and doing the warrior toughness class and sitting in classes and talking to people. I uh, went to the academy and, and talked to the, the plebs over there. Like I've done all these things. So she's like, you have a message. Like, why don't you write it down? Right. And I have thought about writing a book, but I needed her. So, so, so my point is, is that, um, I've been very blessed, man. And I want to, I want to be able to, to share that, that if you put those elements together with the, the fact that you want to admit that you have a problem or that you, you have things that you could work on to that you look for those things to work on, whether it's mm -hmm. if I want to get better, or if I want to, if I want a better career, then I'm going to, you know, get that degree or get that certification. Like you do something about it. And then third, that support system. Like, you know, none of us get to be successful without people in our corner. There is nobody in here right now in this world that has done things alone. Because even if you like, you know, you made it all the way to senior chief, even in those promotions, you know, you might not have anybody necessarily like, um, I don't know, like, you know, do something for you in a, in, a, in a physical way. Like, oh, nobody took that test. Nobody stood that watch. You did it. But then you have people that supported you or encourage you to do those. Yeah. Things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't That's do really nothing true. alone. So I want to I want to bring that up there. Like and, and then also talk about, like I said earlier, about having a why, having a purpose. Um, life becomes um, more beautiful when you have a purpose, whether it is you have a purpose because you want you know, to make people, you know, some people proud or because you have a purpose because you want a better life for yourself and for your family. Like whatever is that purpose is the things that will keep you um, pushing forward when things get difficult, right? Like during the cold, my purpose was my mother. 
And with time, that has changed. She's still there. She's still very high up there. But then that, that has changed now to my children. Like everything right. I do is with the purpose of making them proud and also ensuring that they have a better future. Right. So like as long as we have a purpose in our lives, we're able to accomplish so many things. Because again, I'm, I don't, I'm not special and I have accomplished a lot. But it's, it's definitely having a purpose, having people that believe in me, that care for me. And then... Also, the want to, the wanting to, because you have to put some part of yourself, right? You have to be willing to look for help. You have to be willing to listen to mentorship. You have to be willing to fight for what you want. So when you put those ingredients, there's a lot of things uh, that could be accomplished and, and, and life could be very beautiful. Well said. Well said. Um, Mass Chief Amari Pontiano, Anchored in Resilience, coming soon. Shipmates. Uh, what 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 I really wanted uh, for everybody to see is, like I keep saying, a lot of us that do a whole career in the Navy or any other service and never get to experience any attack or you in actual war, you know? Um, none of us, and I hope to God, none of us ever have to, ever have to go through that experience. But this book you know, read it and take into account everything that happened, what he went through, how he overcame and how it, it still affected him to this day. And uh, you, it's, it's an up to date book. You know, it's not one of, you know, World War Two, you know, but, you know, it's, it's got similar uh, ideas and uh, concepts. But this is a up to date book for today's sailor and it should be on everyone's reading list. Uh, to read and uh, to take some of the uh, ideas and the comments that our Master Chief says to add it to your career so you can have a, a career and life uh, so you can be prosperous in the future. But um, another thing I wanted to ask, this is the last thing, um, but uh, any any final words uh, before we uh, uh tell you? So, so a couple of things, man. Like, I it's is as traumatic as all the 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 cold experience was. Uh, I took a lot of things from it, right? And uh, the first one I will say is, um, and this is very to all all of us that are in the service, and it could even apply to if you were in the civilian sector, right? But definitely in the services, training, training is uh underrated right like I, I feel like sometimes we get away from the importance of training and i say that because like i was saying you know 30 minutes ago when i was talking about how as i was passing i was continuing to close hatches without even thinking about it that is muscle memory and muscle yeah. memory becomes with training so what i will tell you is if you are in that ship right now or you are sure duty and you are having to do these trainings evolution, take it serious, make it meaningful. If you are a leader that are creating these training, make it as realistic as you can, right? Because when shit hit the fan, for lack of other words, we got to be ready. And the only way to be ready is if we prepare ourselves, right? So, you know, it could get tedious, especially if you are on the way and you have a long deployment and every Wednesday we run in GQ or whatever it is. And it's like, oh, another drill or whatever. Make it where it's OK to fail during the drills, because you know what? You usually learn more from when from failures than success. So make it hard. Make it hard where, you know, you know, the whole shop died because we didn't do it correctly because you're going to let, you're going to get lessons learned from that. So that's, that's my first thing. It's about training and about, especially someone like me that only has a year plus left, you know, I gotta, I gotta train my reliefs. Right. So that's mm -hmm. number two is, and this is what I'm about to say. It has nothing to do with the fact that I've been a, a, a chief since 2011. I would have told you this back a year after the coal, two years after the coal, and before I made chief, but I'm definitely going to say it now, is that I understood that the chief's mess and the chiefs were something very important, um, but I definitely saw it and and believed it even more while the coal, the coal 
situation was happening. And I say this because I give you the example of like what that chief said about this flag will fly. I give you the example that once I made chief, I asked um, some of those chiefs that now were, were retired, like how come I saw officers, I saw other enlisted crying and, and nervous or whatever, but I never saw a chief that way. And what they all told me was, yes, we were the same way. But we found a place because the domestics, the, uh, the cheese mess was destroyed. So they found an area where they will talk to each other, cry, yell, whatever they needed to do. But then when they came out, they came out as one. They came out with guidance because I remember as a little seaman, I was looking at my chief for guidance. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's happening today. So that's our responsibility for us that wearing these khakis. We want to make chief. We want to wear these anchors. These anchors are heavy. Act like it, perform like it, understand that there's people looking up to you every single day. And lastly, is that, uh, you know, to the families and, and, and friends uh, from, from the USS Cole, uh, I love you. I love each one of you. Um, I thank you for your support, for your love, for your, for your understanding and for having each other's back, no matter what we are family and we're together forever. Um, and like I said, you know, to the beautiful 17, um, every single day that I put that uniform, I feel a responsibility to each one of you. And I hope that I make you proud. And then on that note, we'll close. We want to again, thank you, Master Chief, for coming on and uh, sharing your experience on the USS Cole during that bombing. And again, we thank you. And again, out there, uh, Anchored in Resilience, put that on your reading list. All right. Well, when it comes out, go ahead and support our shipmate. Not only support our shipmate, but read a good book. I'm pretty sure it's going to be good. You know, it's it's Navy Navy book. All right. Most of us here are in the Navy and uh, it can help you in your life. And if not, you can uh, help a shipmate out as well. Passing on that valuable knowledge that he has in this book. Again, thank you, brother, for coming on. Thank you, brother. All right. Thanks again for watching shipmates. Please like, share and subscribe. Support our shipmate and grab his book and add it to your reading list, like I said. And now we will pay tribute to our shipmates who lost their lives on the USS Cole on October 12, 2000. This will be our shipmate shout out for the day. Here's a memorial video from NavyMemorial.org. Ladies and gentlemen, the wreath will be moved to the U Lone Staler statue outside the Memorial Plaza. And as we conclude, we leave you with a remembrance of the men and women who gave their lives 20 years ago today. Thank you.